tend to eat at one though, instead of 12, but maybe one day we'll, we can all be in person eating together while we're, while we're talking. Although I think there are some ways that Zoom will probably continue and, uh, and have us doing business in ways that we didn't before, but I sure am looking forward to getting back in person too. Um, sorry, I'm running a little bit late. I was just was on a call with Senator Sanders who wanted to reach out to kind of give us a pep talk, give a couple of us a pep talk uh, about the, the funding, the federal funding that we're, that we're slated to receive to support our efforts around uh, recovery. Uh, and, and so we, he was talking to us specifically about summer and summer programming. So I, I have some updates on, on that uh, and we can get into that later. Um, Lunch with Tom, the purpose is for engagement. And one of my three, three priorities coming in was to, was to, to make sure that I'm, I am engaging with, with you uh, and with the, with the entire Burlington community. And so this is just one way for, for me to, to, to do that engagement work. I know that what I heard is uh, on my, as I was coming up here and what I've, what I've learned is that the, that Burlington is, a, is an extremely engaged community, which is something that I find incredibly powerful and, and important in a, in a functioning uh, society. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful about that. And, um, and I wanted to make sure that I was creating multiple kind of venues for, for engagement. So this is, this is one of those, and it's, a, it's an opportunity to engage with, with any, anybody in, in town, uh, staff, parents, members of the public who are invested in our success. Um, and the purpose is really to, you know, I've been doing a quick update at the beginning. So Russ sets a timer for me of 15 minutes, so I don't go over and I'll give some updates on, on what's happening. Um, and then uh, around, around the school, as it relates to the school district. And then we've been opening up conversation for broader uh, BSD wide issues. So any, really anything, any questions, comments, thoughts, uh, I, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, thoughts and, and questions and, and comments today, uh, and it's it's all it's it's all fair game. And the communication, the questions help me. I always feel I'm I'm, I'm wide open. We are wide open to feedback, um, and and so uh, I, I look forward to those opportunities, even if even if they are sometimes hard. Um, if you, I would say, if you have specific questions about your your individual circumstance. Uh, or that of, a, of, of one of your children, um, that you reach out to me uh, directly outside of this venue. I think it's more appropriate to have those personal conversations um, outside of this public space. And my email address is tflanagan, T-F-L-A-N-A-G-A-N, at bsdvt.org. So feel free to reach out to me if you have any kind of specific questions you'd like to discuss. The last uh, purpose here is to build relationships and to build community. We, we don't have this, I don't think today, but we've done a couple breakout, uh, a couple of times where we've had breakout rooms. And so we'll, we'll, we'll probably um, try to schedule those in. We do have a breakout room today. Oh, All right, we have a breakout room today. So a little bit of opportunity to also meet other people and, 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 and pose a, we'll pose a question for, for you all to think about. All right. Uh, so well, what I'd like to do is, is drive us into our district goals. We have a series, we have six district level goals that we created this year. These goals were really to help us build our muscles around setting goals and, um, and analyzing our progress toward those goals and developing strategies to meet the goals. These are one year annual goals that we developed and, and so what we will do over the course of the spring and summer is develop a strategic plan. We're in the fifth year of a five-year strategic plan. We're going to develop a strategic plan this spring and summer. And, and our aim is to finalize the strategic plan in early uh, fall. And then we'll have a, a new set of goals. I imagine there will be some similar ideas to those that are on here. But the idea of the strategic plan is to co-construct the, the goals um, with our community so that they represent the, the community. Um, so we've gone through one of these each time. This time we're, we're, we've gone now through, through uh, at each of the lunches with Tom, we're at goal six here, which is that faculty and staff are a mirror of our student population. They are highly skilled and set high expectations for all students. Um, 
And so what we've been looking at carefully is teacher diversity uh, as we, uh, in, in our metric for this goal. And one of the things that we had to do this year was get a baseline. So last year we had estimated a baseline of 4%, but that was not accurate. Uh, and so we, we really dug in this year to, to have a, a true baseline number, um, which is approximately 6%. I think it's almost 7%. Um, but it, we're, so we're, we're at, a, at 6% uh, of our staff, of our, of our teachers who identify as BIPOC. Uh, and so while 40% of our students identify as BIPOC, we know that we have some work to do to ensure that our, um, our recruitment hiring and retention practices are such that we create a, a workforce that more clearly represents our, our students because we know that when our students um, see our students of color, particularly see, see other students, see, see adults, um, people of color in leadership positions uh, and in teacher positions, they are more likely to be successful long-term. Um, and, and that having diverse, a diverse staff is better for our entire school population as well. So this is a goal that's not a new goal to Burlington. It's been a goal that, that the school board and the district has been working on for a long time. And so we wanted to carry that work forward here. And again, this year has been really about identifying where we are and developing strategies to improve this uh, metric, this, this goal. Mm -hmm. So goal six, um, in addition to the to, to goals, we'll, we'll, you can go ahead and move on, Russ, to the next one. The next one is, uh, is a, the next slide represents some of the uh, key updates that are, uh, I think, important for, the, for you all to, to hear and see um, this week. First is that we are, we are planning to return to in, more in-person learning uh, on April 26th. So we are planning to have 4.5, four and a half days uh, in elementary school. So moving from four days to four and a half days to get five days of, of, of um, school for students, even though I know, and we heard at our last meeting here that half days are not, are not great uh, for families. So I, I understand that. Um, this was moving to four and a half days um, was the way that we could get back another day based on the way that we need to operate to be able to run during, during this pandemic. We need to uh, ask our staff and our teachers to um, do additional, spend additional time with, with students uh, during, during the week. And we have, and so we have taken some of the planning time that they have, and it's important that they have time to plan and plan together. And so we gave that time back on Wednesday afternoon. Uh, and so we, we wanna make sure that we, uh, we have to make sure that we provide that time. And this was the only time that it could, that it could happen. So it, it's, a, it's sort of a turning of the dial a little more to, to get to the goal of fall being back in, in person in full five days a week across all levels. In middle school, we are planning to go, um, to, we're planning to have four days of in-person learning, um, moving from two days for the majority of students, although students with IEPs and students who are learning English uh, one of our kind of equity imperatives at the beginning of the year was to make sure that they had the opportunity to be in school four days a week. Now we're turning the dial so that all students have that access to four days a week of learning in person. Um, and the new guidance that, that um, tells us that students can be three feet apart as opposed to six feet apart, which was the old guidance, allows us to do that. Um, and then in high school, we are moving, uh, we're, we're continuing with the same two day a week schedule and doing some testing. So some of the state assessments and other assessments like the, like today students are, are at the high school uh, taking assessments. So we're using Wednesday for assessments, um, but be, based on the way high schools are scheduled, uh, high school students are scheduled and the building is scheduled, 
we and, and the number of students who are in virtual learning, we had to have teachers teach in the virtual setting. And so that didn't allow, so what that, so what we had to do was, was fill some courses above the 26 or 27 threshold. And so what that ended up doing was creating a situation where if we came back more in person, there would be about 300 students whose schedules would be significantly disrupted, uh, meaning they would have, have to be pulled out of the classes they're in and then placed in different classes. And that just is not, does not, um, not something that we that we can or or want or should do um, with with at the end of the of, of the school year. So the reason for the timing on this is because last week uh, was it last yeah last week the new guidance came out. So the state the agency of education put out new guidance. That guidance allowed for three feet physical distancing um, in grades seven through twelve and gave us new, new guidance that loosened the restrictions around the, the pod structures, the way we group students um, and, the, and the way we run sort of lunch and, cap and, and, and recess. Um, and we're gonna be outside more. So what we know is that there's far less spread of COVID when, when people are outside. Um, and our, num our, our numbers have been, have, while they've been high in the, in the state, and in the region, they have not been high in our schools. So we've been able to continue to, to have success keeping our, our community safe in schools. Uh, and in addition to that, most staff will be vaccinated by, the, by the, that April 26th timeline. Um, and the final piece is that the, the guidance from the agency tells us they have three goals. And the second of the three goals is to be in person more than we are currently. Um, and so what you'll start to see is, all, is the majority of the districts around us moving into a, a, a very similar uh, mode of more in person, but not full in person yet. All those districts may do it a little bit differently and may have a little bit different timelines, uh, but, but, but um, all of our neighboring districts are, are thinking and planning in similar ways right now. Um, so the second item here is the BHS principal search. Uh, so we have three candidates for the principal search. We've put their the three strong candidates. We've put their information out onto the website and, and out into the, into the world, into social media world and, and out there. And we have a community forum tomorrow and we're just looking forward to the opportunity to meeting the candidates. There's also an opportunity if you can't make the forum it live, you can watch the forum. And that forum also, um, along with the forum, there's a feedback form. So you can let us know uh, your feedback on the candidates. And we really look forward to seeing your feedback and to, and to moving forward with this important process for the future of BHS. I talked about the strategic plan, so I'll, I'll kind of leave that for now and we can get into that next time around. The, the, the next piece here is BHS and BTC. So last night, um, I, we had a school board meeting and I explained to the school board that I'm increasingly concerned, I'm very concerned about the BHS BTC uh, 52 Institute Road, which, the, which they're now calling the original BHS. Uh, I'm really concerned about the, the future of the re-envisioning project that we have planned there. Uh, we've learned that there are PCBs. Most recently, we learned there are PCBs up, uh, at least three quarters of an inch into the concrete um, of, the, of the floor. And so that's, that is in addition to the PCBs that we learned were in the caulking, in the walls, in the air, and in the soil. It's taken a long time to figure out, to learn about where the, the PCB issues because we keep finding more and more um, uh, PCBs in this building. So we did not make a decision last night at the school board, but I wanted the school board to know that I was very concerned about the project and that I think we should really strongly consider um, not moving forward with this project and starting to move toward a new uh, building a new a new building a new high school building, but.
but again, we didn't make that decision, but we, we, will, we will need to make that decision um, soon. Tom, if I, if I may just add quickly, um, we're having a problem. I, we accidentally dis disabled the chat. So this link, no one is able to click on. Um, but if you wanna see that presentation, two quick ways to do it, go to our Facebook page. You can see last night's meeting and you'll see about 39 minutes in is where you're gonna wanna go. Um, I'm also gonna work to put that up on the website more clearly today. And then we have a BCOC meeting tomorrow, Building Construction Oversight Committee meeting. That's gonna continue the conversation. And if you go to the Burlington School District website, our calendar, you can click on the meeting information there. Thanks for letting me chime in. Okay, thank you, Russ. And, uh, and then the last piece is, the, is equitable budgeting. So one of the, one of the things that I, I, uh, I told the community that I wanted to do when I first got here well, in my 100 day plan was to develop, um, was to do an equity, equity review and look at our, the way we budget um, as it relates to equity. And so uh, our executive director of finance and operations is uh, Nate Lavery. He is here today. Uh, to talk a little bit about, about the equitable budgeting process that we are currently undergoing right now. And we have a question for you. We'll put you in breakout rooms for a few minutes and come back. Uh, and then we'll, we'll save at least a good 25 to 30 minutes for just open conversation at the end. So Nate, could you talk a, a bit about equitable budgeting? Sure, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. So. Yeah, one of the exciting projects that uh, Superintendent Flanagan brought to us and that we have begun in earnest is a project designed to develop an equitable uh, budgeting and staffing model for our district. And I think it's important to understand kind of when we started this process, we identified the goal is the equitable funding and staffing model, um, that, but that having that model be both transparent and predictable. So just to kind of give people a flavor of what you know, kind of what those words represent in, in our work. The reference to our budget and staffing model being equitable is really about driving the money and the resources to the students who need it most. And that's the, the central goal of this pro project is to ensure that, that we are really living up to our stated equity goals by putting our money and our resources in those places where they can make the most difference for students in need. The other elements though that we thought were really important in this initiative were transparency and predictability. So we wanted to make sure that stakeholders, whether they're students, staff, or community members, really understand both why we're doing this work and also how our budget and funding formula works. So that's the transparency element. When um, you know, just developing the model is not gonna be the end of this project. We're gonna have to work really hard to make sure that people understand why we're doing it and how it works because we want people ultimately to support the model and to understand that it's moving us toward our equitable, our equity goals. And then also um, predictability is important. One of the challenges I think in any organization that has a annual budget cycle can be making long-term plans, multi-year plans, really um, pursuing strategic objectives that frankly can't be achieved in a single year, even under the best of circumstances. So we wanna make sure that this model offers predictability and it doesn't see, it can't be a model that from year to year results in such dramatic change of where resources go that school leaders um, and their school board and so forth, if they can't use it to make long-term plans, it's not going to be uh, useful and it's not really gonna help us reach our long-term goals. So equitable, uh, equitable you know, model is the number one priority, but the transparency element and the predictability of it are also really important goals in this, in this project. Um, and one other thing I would point out about the project is, it's important to understand, I think, is that it's not a budget cutting or budget growing kind of initiative. That's not the point of this. This is really a question of improving how we allocate the resources we have, whether those resources are going up or down in any given year. Um, in terms of the structure of the project, we have a uh, work group that I'm leading that's doing the core work of evaluating various approaches to budget, uh, budget design, and ultimately we'll be developing the model that works for Burlington. But we're being really intentional about seeking input into that process. Um, just yesterday, the superintendent led a student focus group at Hunt Middle School, 
And uh, we also, and we're going to be doing that at both of our middle schools and our high school. And we also have a community service uh, survey out there. Um, and we are also being really intentional within that process about making sure that we get representation in the focus groups and responses to our survey from um, groups that are marginalized or that traditionally don't uh, exercise much voice in the budget process. We wanna make sure that there is an avenue for, for those perspectives. And um, finally, I would say that kind of where we are in the process at this point in terms of the data that we've already looked at is, it's kind of a, a mixed bag. We've actually done some analysis that shows that for example, as a district, we already tend to spend more money on the schools where our uh, achievement is lower, which is a good sign. But I think that one of the challenges for us is to do that more intentionally and to do that with a stronger connection to, to student outcomes. So there's a lot of work to be done here at the moment, but um, we're excited to begin this work. And I think we have a little breakout question that we can keep people up with. Yeah. So here's your question. We're going to zoom you. We're going to uh, create a couple of breakout rooms, three to four people uh, for five minutes. The breakout question is, what is one example of inequitable funding that you have seen in our district? That's going to help us as we go. But also, what is one example of equitable funding that you've seen in our district? So we want to know sort of the good and the bad. We don't we want to make sure that we're not fixing things that aren't necessarily broken. So if you can come up with uh, each of those and then uh, I'll pull you back in five minutes. So at four minutes, you'll have a one minute warning. Please in also introduce yourselves and then we'll come back and report out and that will lead right into our discussion time. Thank you, everybody. Here we go. Oh, maybe. I'm same actually, Edmonds Middle and High School. Uh, high right. School senior okay. and a seventh grader. Hello. Okay. Hi. Hi. And Russ, you are, are you with the district? I am with the district. I do communication and public relations with the district. Um, we were just saying that we are parents of a middle schooler and a high schooler. Awesome. With different kids, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you wouldn't be introducing yourselves to each other, would you? <laughs> Probably not. Um, and I also work with Vermont Voices, which is my other kind of reason to be here. Great. So I don't know um, if anybody's had a opportunity to think about the question. I've not looked at the the budget in minute detail. So I would have a hard time answering that. Um, I guess my concerns that I've learned from a lot of the volunteer work that I've done um, is the literacy rate is so low. And I know that Vermont and Burlington isn't um, alone in this. It seems to be a national wide phenomenon, but that is something that's deeply concerning because it's something like, I think for black and brown children, it's like 52% of kids are not reading on grade level and 48% of white children aren't. So their white kids aren't doing all that much better. Um, and I, it's probably linked to also to income. And I'm a teacher myself. I teach part-time, but I'm in a private school. Um, so it's just sort of a different, it's a different ball game there. Um, and I also wonder about accountability um, in terms of, you know, we have these goals and it seems like we put them out all the time and it doesn't, I'm not seeing a lot of movement in terms of progress. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a private school teacher, my feet are held to the fire. If I'm, if I'm not successful with my kids, you know, 
kids do not sign up for my class and I'm axed. <laughs> it's that simple. Mm-hmm. You know, I have to be really good at what I do. And I would love to see that same sort of accountability sort of put into teacher contracts. Um, just like, you know, I know that there's a lot of things that, that um, I know there's a lot of things you can't control as a teacher, you know, the kids that you have, but it just feels like there needs to be movement at least towards. And if there's like consistently not kids not being successful, um, that, that, that just feels like we need some accountability there, some sort of measurement of at least progress of what we can control. Mm-hmm. Gail, how about you? Do you have examples of, of things that you've seen in the district that you feel are equitable or inequitable in the way that they're funded? Um, that's tricky because, you know, as a parent, I don't really see the budget. I don't really see um, where the money is coming from or going to. And um, I mean, I, there's inequities, but I'm not sure if there's any uh, like bias in how they're being addressed um, with resources. So yeah, I, I kind of feel like I don't have enough information to make a judgment. What have your, Gail, what are your experiences with, have your kids had with the, the schools? I'm just curious. Have, have you um, felt like their needs have been met? It, in some sense, yes, for the most part. And when I look at the district overall, I feel like, you know, equitable equitability is or whatever is the right um equal is not equitable and so to speak and um i have kids whose needs haven't fallen into the traditional um when you think of kids with needs like i they don't have special education or if anything i have felt like they haven't been given the opportunity to expand their um learning as much as they could um and you know that I feel like they haven't had the individual attention to their growth um, mm-hmm. that they would have in a um, school system that maybe had I don't know um, it was smaller or smaller classes or something where they could get more individual. Yeah. So and I always feel like such a privileged person to say stuff like that because um, I am fortunate that my kids don't struggle, but. You know, it does make me think they might not be in the right place sometimes. Yep, I can understand that. It looks like we're being closed down in 30 seconds. (laughs) So Russ, we didn't really get to hear from you. Yeah, I don't know. One thing that I that I have personally just enjoyed seeing, I've only been here for three years, was last year's push to make sure that we had a bus route that runs from the north, uh, the north end to the south end. I felt like that was finally a move towards equity in the right direction. All right, I think we have everybody back. And be um, so if we could have, um, if someone from each group would like to just take a second to share, I think that'd be really helpful to think, uh, just share something that you observed in your group. Um, so take it away, don't wait for me to call on you. Uh, you can unmute yourself and chime in if you feel you feel like you have something to share. I'll go quick. Um, so our group, uh, one of the th- uh, discussion was uh, one example of equitable funding. Uh, I know the Burlington School District, uh, Burlington High School right now, um, offering these five languages this semester is really great. Nepali, Arabic, I might be wrong, but anyway, that's really super great to see. It's just so great as a, you know, um, multilingual person, it's really good that school is promoting, even though not many students are right now taking, but I'm hoping to see more. So that's a one great example. Uh, 
Thank you. I'll go. Our group talked briefly about equi um, being equitable with people with accessibility issues on, on that whole lens and um, surround um, in a conversation surrounding awards and scholarships given out at graduation. Can you elaborate a little bit on that, Kate? Thank you, Tom. No, we need more time to talk about it. Nope. <laughs> uh, Nate, you talk. You're you're the eloquent one out of the two of us. Well, I think no, but but I think what we did talk about and what Kate was uh, had observed is the fact that the there tend to be a narrow group of students who receive a lot of those awards, and they tend, you know, what we were kind of wondering was whether the the eligibility or the criteria on which those awards were based really gives students uh, a kind of equal shot at competing for them. And we also wondered essentially whether the um, financial, you know, rewards that come with those, that recognition are being used in the way that is likely to kind of in, result in the most gain of, of success for our, for our students and, uh, or whether, you know, whether we should be targeting that spending and those awards in a different direction that maybe um, could make the difference between a student really reaching that next level or, or not, as opposed to kind of just making it a reward for students who've already achieved that much. I'll share um, for my, uh, someone in my group, but I'm not gonna out them, but if they wanna sort of correct me or elaborate on, on what I thought that I heard is that sometimes it feels like if you're, if your child doesn't have special needs, their, their regular needs also might not get met in terms of class sizes or in resources that um, sometimes there's so much of a focus on um, the other students. And that that's a hard thing to admit as a parent because when it comes out of your mouth, you recognize that you sound privileged, but you still wanna advocate for your child. And my, my example of equitable funding was I was really um, excited about the bus route that the district uh, put into place last year that could take families from the north end to the south end as we continue to try to integrate our schools and, and diversify our district. What other, what other uh, not uh, thoughts were out there? Let's do a couple more and then we can just kind of open it, open it up. Hi, Tom. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Polly Vanderputten, and I'm school commissioner representing Ward 3, and also a parent of kid in Burlington schools, and also a public school teacher. So I like to come to these meetings because I learn a lot. So um, we covered a lot of ground in our group, although I'm afraid we didn't totally touch on the equitable funding question. But um, one person said there's a perception of inequity between Edmonds Middle School and Hunt. And it's kind of hard to put a finger on why, but then one other person in the group said that she had heard it came down to like access to health resources and health, this person could elaborate more on it, but like access to health and healthy programs and healthy way of living and better access to health stuff. Sorry, that wasn't very articulate. Um, my example was field trips that usually there's a lot of fundraising that has to happen for field trips or that families are asked to pay and kind of put it in a kitty and to pay extra for kids who can't afford to go. And I see that people are doing that, but I also see that field trips are really essential part of learning. And so I wonder how we could make that more equitable for all students. Um, and another person mentioned libraries, that there's some kind of disparity, it feels like, between different schools and the libraries and the resources that they have or how innovative they are. Hmm. And finally, I brought up this thing that I'm still kind of figuring out, kind of big picture, which is the um, ability of some families to afford to send their kids to alternative programs. This kind of touches on, I think, what, um, what Russ was just saying, that in the elementary school, if you feel like your child is not being stimulated enough or like it's tedious, there are some families who can afford to send their kids to Crow's Path to get them or to the Davis studio to get them in some art classes. But then that leaves behind those kids who might also benefit from that, 
whose parents don't have the resources or access to that. So the question for me is, how do we get more kids getting that kind of education in the district? Not necessarily like we have to like pay to put them out, but how do we balance our funding so that we have kind of more of those outdoor programs so all kids are accessing it, not just families who can afford it. So that it's incorporated more in-house is what you're saying rather than having to leave to have a different type of programming. Yeah, I know a lot of families that feel no qualms about pulling their kids out for one or two days a week to send them to an alternative program so that they can get that environment. And I want to say, shouldn't all kids have that? Yeah, so like bring that kind of thing, collaborate, find partnerships, take opportunities for innovation right now with COVID recovery funds to see what we can do with that. Those are my brainstorming ideas in the moment right now. Sorry if I threw a lot out there at you. Tom, I don't want to shut down this conversation, particularly if Nate finds it helpful, but I do want to point out that we have about 20 minutes left and I felt like there were some heavy topics in the in, in your updates today, so. Yeah, I think let's move into, if, if people want to talk a little bit more about what we were just talking about, we can feel free to sort of add that into a comment or a question and we can just open up the, the questioning uh, more broadly than equitable budgeting. Um, I will say uh, it's, hel it's really helpful to hear um, the, the things that are, are on your minds. Uh, and it was, um, there, there was an opportunity to more formally get, get that feedback. So we're, Nate's taking some notes and, and we're hearing you here. And then there's also this, this uh, more formal way to get feedback. So uh, please let us know your thoughts that way too. We met with the students at Hunt yesterday. So we're meeting with students at Hunt, Edmonds, um, and, the, and the high school. And the students at Hunt yesterday told us that they really want to see more different types of offerings. Uh, that was one of the things that really um, came through to me clearly from them was at the middle school level. They feel very relatively positive about their experience, uh, both in elementary and middle school, and, uh, and felt like they wanted to um, just have different kinds of offerings uh, beyond sort of the tradition, not the traditional, but the music and art that we offer to offer different kinds of, of, um, of learning experiences, um, you know, that like the kind of CTE offerings that we offer in high school. Um, so I thought that was interesting and worth putting out there. So why don't we, why don't we open it up? Any, any other thoughts or questions on anything? I have a question if that Absolutely. goes back to budgeting. budgeting. Um, I love the idea of equitable budgeting, but I, I'm, I'm ignorant on this topic, but I'm kind of curious to find out that, that we weren't doing equitable budgeting before. <laughs> what, <laughs> what is the, um, if it's a quick answer, uh, I don't wanna take up too much time with it, but um, I, I guess I just would assume that schools would get an e equal amount. Maybe there's just a, a formula that wasn't applied in the same way. So it, my question is, what were we doing before? We did an equitable budgeting? Yeah, I think is the I'll, I'll ask after I'll I'll preface that and then I'll ask Nate because I I come in with a fresh set of eyes right so I get to sort of in my first year I'm observing and 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 seeing things maybe differently, uh, but Nate has done a lot of work in our district to get our budgeting practices under control, um, and and so we were running deficits uh, is what I understand. And, and we needed to put systems in place to address that. The next level of work is how, how, do, how are we clear on the way that we are funding our individual schools based on the students they have and compared to other like schools. Uh, so, so that's really the, the deep work. We've done some of it uh, but it just hasn't been as, as systematic as we'd like. And some of that has to do with other systems that we need to build so that we really are clear on staffing levels at schools. What are the formulas that go into those staffing levels um, that we don't have, right? The, the, those formulas. So it's really thinking about uh, it just more strategically. Uh, and it's not that what we found in this, in this review is it's not that we're budgeting inequitably, you see some inequities and you see some, some 
equities, right? You see some good some good practices, uh, but there we wanted to to dig in a little bit more and really focus focus in on this. Nate, why don't you add add more? Because you're you're. I think you I think you covered most of it. I I, I think that the it, it I would really focus on the kind of being intentional about it, having everyone be able to understand the process and and why it's happening and why and really what it means, which is that each school, even schools of the same size in terms of enrollment may have different amounts of staffing or money because of the unique needs of their student body. And so I think we often confuse the equality notion with equity. And what we're saying is we're not pursuing equality. We're not just gonna say, you know what, every school gets $200 per student because we recognize that that is not equitable. It might be equal, but it's not equitable. And so we wanna be really intentional about describing our, the difference between those things and coming up with a formula that focuses on, on the equity element. Um, and then it, you know, that will translate into interesting questions about how alike or dissimilar offerings can be at schools, right? How much flexibility do we want to give schools to make unique choices and, and let the principals kind of experiment with new ideas and really give staff the power to, to um, be creative? And on the other hand, we want to ensure that the that a student gets a great education and has you know access to many of the same opportunities, no matter which, for example, elementary school that they attend across the city. So it's not going to be an easy process, but um, foremost among the kind of goals here is helping people understand that that difference and that it may be that one school has more dollars, for example, per student than another, but it's based on an equity formula. Can I, just say Can I just say some more? So I think if we just look around who's here, like we just said it like there's a 60% of uh, white uh, student bodies and right. but who's here? <laughs> so that's really obvious. And what are some efforts that we're making? The people who are like 40, almost 40%. And I just like look into, I mean, Burlington School District website, I was really impressed. Like there's so many like information or a lot of resource. And I also found out there's this report on um, and also like there's like multi-language programs and you can kind of click and I can see like Korean language. It was really cool. But the, one of the information that I found was if we have like English language learners, almost like 12% and also former that I didn't think about. If a former uh, EL students are a little more 20%, that means at least like 35% of students may their home language might not be English. And then how much we're doing for those families. And I know that we have multi-language liaisons and like, I mean, it's a lot, I, even for me, like understanding, like if I, my child is like special needs and a lot of information that's like, oh, I don't know, I need help. So how much we're really providing. And I really wanted to, I mean, I think it's like more language liaisons are super amazing, but are we using too much of them? Or, or do we have enough resources? Are we, how much are we, are, I kind of wanted to more, know more about how much we're really like putting the budget for that populations. And also how about, it's not about Multilingual language liaisons are taking care of students of color because also teachers too, like how much resources we are putting for teacher training too. I mean, it's like ongoing. It's like, anyway, that's what I think. And I'm going to be really kind of consistent with like some multi-language. So I'm going to stop now. No, but I think that's, a, that's an important point. And that's, that um, kind of is what we're trying to get at, right? And I, one of the things, one of the challenges that we face in Burlington is that our state has an inequitable funding formula that doesn't consider English learners uh, and students who qualify for Title I uh, appropriately. And that's been clearly documented in a recent study by the University of Vermont, Rutgers University and the American Institute of Research that the Agency of Education commissioned. They found that our district, Winooski, and, and some other districts that have a higher Title I population, and it includes a number of districts um, in the Northeast Kingdom and, and districts um, in, in, in a more rural setting than ours, um, are, are, are not getting the funding that we should be getting. Um, and, and so what that does is it, it drives up, uh, not getting the weighting we should be getting, so it ends up driving up tax prices, tax rates, um, to get to the right amount of funding. So it, it sort of, it burdens the, the, the schools and the district 
so there's the school board has been leading on a, on pushing the state to to take action on that funding formula. Um, so there are two things happening now, and Nate is actually um, a, a, a plays a leadership role in the in the in the business manager world in in Vermont. So knows this this part of the work really deeply too. So. We're doing two things. We're advocating at the state level for the right amount of funding for the right for the right equalized pupil. They call it the right sort of amount per student um, that's weighted based on student need and working to create our own formulas within the district. Uh, but they speak specifically to our English learners, our students with IEPs, our students who qualify for Title I. So that's that's core to the work, and I appreciate you bringing it up. I also don't want uh, it to get lost. I think your comment on um, sort of looking around the room, if you will, and saying um, who's represented and who's not represented. I know that's something that is super important to Superintendent Flanagan, and and he's asked me to make sure that this uh, this meeting itself actually is uh, more equitable and is more accessible, and it's something that we want to be working on, and we need to do a better job. So I just want to thank you for saying that and pushing us to be better about it. Um, that's feedback that we we appreciate uh, truly we talk about it a lot but i think as, as superintendent says we need to um, move from talk to action so uh, we'll try to do a better job and kind of tagging on that i'd be really curious to hear if there would be some updates on the family advisory council um i know that's a new bit, um group that's been formed but it'd be really cool to here are some of the topics that have come up in that group. Sure. And yeah. I have one other question that's un unrelated. Um, and I don't know if I should ask it now because it's tangential, but um, I dropped my sons off at the um, in the morning at um, the Pine Street, Bank Street drop off. And I don't know if other parents have found that spot to be really kind of sketchy and dangerous. I don't I mean, there's so many um, construction trucks and very limited parking there. Um, anyway, just wondering if others or if I'm just being paranoid. Okay. Are you're talking about the drop off behind the high school? Yeah, yeah, because we I dropped them off with their bikes. And so right. um, I need to be there for a minute or two. So it's a little a little nervous when they're crossing over across the road because it you know, it doesn't I don't there's so many construction trucks right there at that Okay. window of time and their meters it's metered parking so often the spots are taken um okay i i haven't I'm heard about it. no I, we i'll look into it i haven't heard about that problem i know there are other high school um parents on the call and high school staff so i don't know if there's other and then i could talk a little bit about the advisory group um shanta i'm just gonna say i obviously hopefully try to drive my kid and park in the garage, but coming from the North end, I was not sure how to get over there. So I, when I was dropping off my son, I would just kind of go in front of the cathedral, the road in the cathedral and drop him off there and have him walk over. So I wasn't following the rules because I was like, it was gonna to be too tricky. Thank you, Kate. And I'm a rule <laughs> follower as you all know. So that's, you know, say a lot. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll, well, let me, let me, I'll check it. We'll check into that and make sure that, that we're out there and watching and that it's safe. Um, I appreciate you bringing that up. And then I think just one thing, my kid walks Yes. Um, from uh, up by UVM mm -hmm. and um, you know, as long as they're crossing at the crosswalks, I know there's some trucks down there, but there are designated crosswalks. I know kids especially the teens, they need to be reminded, like, listen, you're not um, invincible. Cross at the crosswalks is a lot safer than just cutting across even what they think is a not busy street. Right, that's a good point. I, I think it has to be a systemic solution and maybe an individual, you know, I, it, it, it just, just, yeah, I appreciate you taking a look at it, Tom. Yeah. Definitely, definitely will do. Um, and then the family advisory group, we, we actually have a family advisory group, a, a student advisory group, and a teacher advisory group. And we've been meeting once a month with, which, with each of those. Um, last night, we had a meeting, Victor uh, Prusak, who was on the call earlier, I think he's not here anymore, but he and I do those together. We met with, with students and had a great conversation. We, we talked about the things that um, 
the sort of unexpected positives of their experience experiences this year, the challenges of this year and what they hope to carry forward. We'll probably do that with families too. What we found is that we kind of go in with one group and, and with a, we have sort of, we did a circle with them, with students, and then and then the, the topic either resonates or doesn't resonate and, and we carry it forward. So we'll probably do that with the family group. Um, the family group, um, we've been we've been getting feedback on um, the planning for recovery, on the planning for summer, on feedback for from how things are working um, currently, and it's it's been a way for for us for me to hear directly from families about what we um, what's working and what's not not working. Um, and, <laughs> and, and we've been very intentional about creating, um, about making sure that our, our advisory groups are representative of our, of our student body. So we've done some very specific um, outreach to ensure that we have uh, interpretation and, and we have accessibility at those, at those spaces. And it's been for me, a, a proof point of where, of how it, how it's possible to make sure that we have representative voice at spaces where important things are, you know, where 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 there are important decisions that that may be made, um, and where there are important conversations that that need to happen. Um, so what I've done is I've gone out and I've met with our multilingual families a couple of different times in 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 different groups this year and heard from them and have invited them kind of specifically to participate in that group and that that we've done with both um, families and students and that's been really really helpful um, the other thing that and what it's what we've done here is creating in both of those groups uh, opportunities for people to break out into rooms and to talk together because zoom is cold and and can be quiet right or it takes a while to kind of get warmed up and so breaking into breakout rooms allows people to meet each other and to and to talk. So I've been I've been clear with the advisory groups. I'm not making this, I'm not telling the community that I'm hearing from individual members and we're making decisions based on that, but they're really helping to give me feedback and kind of help me think through things that are that that we're that we're working through as a as a district. So it's been a really great experience. What we'll probably do is carry, we will definitely do them next year. We'll carry them. Uh, do some combination of putting it out for people to 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 apply again, um, and or to apply and to be a part, and and then also keep some people on who want to want to stay on. So there'll probably be some combination of, of those two things. I want to make sure that we're opening it up to to the the you know broadest group uh, possible, and that that continues to to cycle uh, that process. Um, Tom. This is Carolyn Hansen. I have a comment and a question. Okay. Um, I appreciate the update on the family advisory. And I guess my comment would be, it's a, it's a small comment, but um, I think it would be great if someone at the district followed up with the people who had applied. Like I know I put in and I fully understood not being selected because I think we do need a very representative group, but I think it would be nice to follow up with people so that they know that you actually did get their application and you know, maybe I appreciated your update today and maybe some sort of like, I don't know, it have to be minutes, but something that went out to yeah. folks that have expressed an interest just so they can follow the group. And, you know, there may be a topic that comes up that resonates with a lot of people and that might give you more feedback if it resonates with a sort of a larger community issue. Um, so I just felt like for me, that kind of fell off the radar and I wasn't yeah. even quite sure what I kind of forgot. Like, did I put in an application for the middle school group or the high school? I don't even really remember, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. I know I, I did fill it out. I never heard anything about it. So just a small comment. Um, no, and my that's question... not a small... yeah, that's an important comment. I, I, I thought <laughs> we had gotten back to people. It, I'm, ha I'm, I'm not happy to hear that we didn't, but I'm happy. I'm, thank you for telling me. Um, sure. and I like the idea of, of sort of topics, making sure those are out there and, 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 um, and sort of follow ups around that. So I, I appreciate, I appreciate that. And part of the, the idea around this group was also just to create another opportunity. So for, so, so there are a couple of different spaces, some that are wide open, some that, you know, have an application process and, and to make sure that we're, we're reaching a, a, the broadest audience as possible. 
Yeah. And it's definitely not a complaint on my end. I really appreciate what you're doing right now. Like, I mean, for folks who have the ability to tune in on a phone or whatever, I mean, I was so impressed when I tuned into this. I've only, this is the second time I've come, but I wanted to come back because it is really an opportunity to have some real conversations. I appreciate that. And I wanted to follow up with you because the other time I came, I asked you a question about what was going to happen to eighth grade algebra. And um, I just wanted to check in with you because uh, I have not heard any official announcement from uh, administrators, but my daughter was told in her algebra class that they were still going to have algebra, but it was going to be remote just on Wednesday. So it was going to be cut down to one day a week. And that's what the teacher told her. Um, I don't know if that's actually a decision that's been made and the, and the teacher you know, knows that or it's just that that's what the teacher is anticipating. So he was just kind of letting the students know. Um, but either way, I just wanted to reiterate um, yeah. my concern that any reduction of the amount of time that the eighth graders are getting for math and for algebra, any kind of math, um, I would just hate to see that happen because I can recall when I had another student in eighth grade um, how much there was a push at the end to cover all this material that they hadn't quite gotten to and how important that was because when my child got to high school he felt very well prepared and was where he should have been in geometry and an observation uh, that he made was that students from Hunt did not seem similarly as well prepared so coming back to one of the equity questions we talked about earlier, and I don't know if there's ways to kind of get feedback from teachers, like ninth grade teachers. Do they feel that students come in similarly well prepared for courses? And if they don't, it may not be a funding issue. It may be sort of a uh, looking at teacher support and quality and making sure that they, those teachers are talking to each other. So they're covering all the materials. Um, but I am really concerned about this current class of eighth graders because they had that combined seventh, eighth grade math. They haven't had the same amount as nobody has, but I mean, them in particular, they were kind of shortchanged on math. And now it sounds like they could potentially be shortchanged on algebra. So I'm just really hoping that we can figure out a way that they can continue at the same level of instruction that they've been receiving during remote learning. Yeah, let me, I, I did follow up on that. I know we are continuing algebra, but I didn't know, I didn't, I have not talked to James and Maddie about the number of days. So I'll, I'll follow up on that. And I hear your, your feedback and I appreciate, I appreciate your follow up with me. The other thing that, that's coming up um, in what you're saying and a couple of other people have said is that we are, uh, Hunt and, and Edmonds have had pretty different programs. And what we're working to do is to create a lot more consistency and alignment between the, the maths, math science and also the humanities or ELA and social studies um, program offerings at, at the two schools. And so that's something that where James Keeper, who's the principal at Edmonds and Maddie Scheidt, who's the principal at Hunt have been meeting regularly with, with together. And then I've been meeting with them with Stephanie Phillips, who's our executive director for teaching and learning. And we're really working on making sure that we're clear on what we do uh, similarly across schools so that schools can have their own things, right? Their own flair, but there's some base expectations or some base coordination and collaboration and consistency and coherence that we have across the two middle schools. So that's that's work that that every, I think everyone wants to do. I've heard from teachers too, that they, they want that. Um, so that's that's something that we're also working on. All right, it's one more time. Yeah, why don't we do one more question and then we'll then we'll close out. All right, I'm not seeing any. So what if there is one more, but before that, I just want to reiterate, please go to the website. Gail, we'll we'll take your question, but I just want to make sure everyone hears this. The equitable budgeting survey, again, the chat was disabled today. So please go to the website or look in your email. We would love your feedback on that please watch the PCB update or attend tomorrow night's meeting and please attend tomorrow night's uh, principal search. You can find it on the homepage. Thank you. Good, sell, good sales pitch, Russ.
Um, so I just wanted to, maybe the survey answers this question, but um, it wasn't clear to me when we started the conversation about equitable funding, and maybe this isn't true, but that you were looking for variables to feed into that equation about who should get more money and less money. Like we're talking about um, multilingual and language and things like that. Like those are factors that should feed into a budget formula. Are you looking for us to propose others or how is that decision going to be made about what variables get weighted how? Well, we're, we're actually working with a group that, that has done some equitable budgeting uh, work in other districts. So they worked in DC public schools, they've worked in a couple of other, of other districts. Um, and there are, there, are some, there are some formulas out there that, uh, that apply weightings. Um, and so that's what we've heard is that students, from what we've heard from principals is that principals feel like they're just getting a certain number of teachers every year, uh, sort of not, not necessarily based on their school population or even the, the, the need within the school population. And so we're trying that that's sort of the equality um, we, uh, perspective, right? We took like everyone gets the same, but schools aren't the same. Um, and so how do we sort of how we want to become more nuanced about how we apply funding. We get we get different levels of funding for students with different levels of need. So then it's our responsibility to give a different level of funding to schools based on the, the student populations that, that they have. So yeah, and yeah. I think in the in the survey, there's not a lot of necessarily um, sort of open feedback like that. I think there is a place in there where you can you can drop some comments if you have them. I think one important question on there is there's actually a ranking question of what you consider to be the priorities when we're developing a school budget. Um, and it sort of goes back to if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. So that group that meets there, there is a, a task force, if you will. I'm sorry. Uh, and, um, but they have come up with these questions that um, we, we really want to hear from you all. Like when we're doing this, what do you think our priorities should be in terms of funding? And then, it, and, and then we also, um, one thing that Nate and I have talked about is, is, is Tom's right early on, there had been some work around equitable budgeting and trying to improve those models, but we never communicated that out to the community. So part of this too, is to get a baseline of your understanding of school budgets so that we can do a better job communicating. Great, thank you. All right, thanks. Thank you, Gail. Thank you all, it's good to see you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you. Thanks a lot.